Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always is a man that spent the weekend playing reindeer games. Ladies and gentlemen, the man that is guiding our flying garage ship, he is the captain. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Tonight, we are drinking Circus City IPA by Big Top Brewing Company. Garage grade three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. Hoppy, malty, and smooth. And I would say it's a little sweet as well. 6.8 ABV. Check out Big Top Brewing Company. And this week's beer is brought to us by our good friends. First up, we have Meg in Colchester, UK. And over in Brooklyn, we have our buddy Scott. Next, we have John in Cudahy, Wisconsin. John says, the West Memphis Three did it. Well, I guess everybody has an opinion. Next up, we have Nell from Hayden Lake, Idaho. I want to give a shout out to our friend Sarah P. and her husband, two Buckeyes down in Benton, Kentucky. And last but not least, a shout out, a long distance shout out to Bianca listening in Beijing, China. So thanks to everybody for filling up the fridge for this week's show. If you want to help us out with next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And like I said yesterday, the We Like Your Jib shirts are going fast, so they're going to sell out soon. So if you want one of those, get those today at truecrimegarage.com. Don't disrespect the captain. Make sure you get your shirt. That's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Down this road here by the bridge, and this road going around here, and they brought him out there, and they started dragging him, drug him up down the road, and lost his keys down there. That's where they got all these circles in the road, and lost a piece of flesh there, and all down this road, all the way to the graveyard, and that's where they unhooked him at. They lost the head before you got to the gray yard on the right. And, and that's all I said. Well, I didn't see that, but I saw the little flesh out there. On Saturday, June 6, 1998, 49-year-old James Bird Jr., he spent the day hanging out with his friends and family. He attended two different parties, and after the second party, he left there quite late that night, about 1 to 1.30 a.m. that evening. Now, he was walking home. His apartment was on the other side of town, and this is when he encountered three men in a pickup truck who had offered him a ride. The next day at 7 a.m. on Sunday, his body was found located on the road and in very bad condition. His head and his shoulder were found almost a mile away. Where we left off, we were in the middle of the investigation and they were getting ready to bring in the FBI. And this is when they are talking to Sean Barry. Now, Barry was one of the three men believed to have been in the pickup truck that evening. James Bird Jr. had been spotted by eyewitnesses in a pickup truck matching that description. Well, when the sheriff's department, when they have Sean Barry and the other two men in custody and they're talking with them, remember we said that we were, they were probably trying to get them to turn on one another. Right. It was it was becoming clear to these to the sheriff that these three men were very likely involved in this murder and that they had committed it together. If you can get these guys to start turning on each other, you're going to get information that can help you put together a case and take these dirt bags to trial. Yeah. And they believe that this was a hate crime. And that's why they wanted to get the FBI involved. And once, once they started telling the suspects that 
that's when we get Sean Barry, who gets the encouragement that he needed to tell us what he what happened according to him, right. his side of the story as to how this murder took place. Well, Barry states that they saw he was traveling with the other two men, Bill King and Russell Brewer, and that they had saw James Byrd walking that night. And this was like we said in the early morning hours. This would be about. 1 32 a.m. Right. And he was heading across town back to his apartment. Sean Barry says that it was he, in fact, that had offered James Bird a ride. James Bird accepts the ride. There's a little bit of the communication between the two that seems a little strange to me. Um, the way that Barry puts this years later is that he offered, he said, Hey, do you want us to drive you home? Mm -hmm. And to which he says, James Bird Jr. said, well, I'll ride around with you guys for a while. And we talked about James and his character and who he was. He was he was a happy guy. He was in a good mood. He liked to socialize with people. He was known for being kind of a good timing guy. Right. And sometimes you, you have individuals, you're, you're one such individual that sometimes when you get going mm -hmm. in your party mode, you're not going to stop, you know? So it could have been as simple as, yeah, you could drive me home, or what are you guys up to? So Sean Barry said that he had stopped and offered the ride to Bird. Early reports speculated that uh, James Bird and Mr. Barry may have known each other because I guess they had the same parole officer. The Associated Press reported that this was a possibility. Now, Sheriff Rolls, I believe it was he that, that said at one point that the two could have seen each other at, you know, when they have to go visit their parole officer. Mm-hmm. Um, according to Sean Barry, he claims that he did not know James Bird, but he did, in fact, recognize him as someone who frequently walked around the town of Jasper, Texas. Bill King, after James Bird is in the truck, Bill King became upset and began, he began cursing. So Bill is upset with Sean for giving James Bird a ride. Mm -hmm. The men stopped at a convenience store. And this is when Bill King is going to take over the driving. So he drives the men down a dirt road. All four men are back in the truck at this point. During this short drive, Bill King says to Barry that he is about to scare Mr. James Bird. Mm -hmm. So instead of taking James Bird Jr. home, Barry, Brewer, and King, they drove east out of Jasper. And they stopped at a small clearing in the woods. Now, this is where investigators believe that there was some kind of fight in this clearing because of the upturned grass, the disturbed dirt, the broken beer bottles. Right. According to Sean Barry, Bill King and Russell Brewer opened up James Bird's door and they were trying to pull him out of the truck. James was hanging on to the door with both hands, trying to keep himself inside the truck. Right. I won't repeat all that was said according to Sean Barry as far as, you know, what what the other two men were saying at this time. But at some point, Bill King has announced to the group that he would like to kill James Bird. Right. The group, according to Sean Barry's story at this point, should be well aware of what very likely could happen next. And even more horrifying and terrifying is that James Byrd is now aware of what this guy's intentions are. Mm -hmm. Barry says that he was, he was horrified and he was helpless and he yeah. sat there and he watched as the two men pulled James Byrd from the truck. Once James was out of the truck, Sean Barry, he got, he got between Bill King and James Byrd telling Bill King to stop what they were doing. Bill King then threatens Sean Barry's life. Sean Barry says that at this point in the story, James Bird is very intoxicated. He's, he's very drunk. The other two men took James Bird to the back of the truck. Sean Barry says there was no problem getting Bird to the back of the truck. I mean, he's once they get him out, he's being overpowered by two people. And according to Barry, James Bird is very intoxicated. 
So this this would make sense that they're able to easily overpower the man. Sean Barry does not explain how the men got James Bird to the ground. I don't think he knows for certain, but he does say it was no trouble for the men to get him to the ground. So well, there's a possibility it's not just two on one. It's it's a good possibility there's three on one, and we're just not getting the full story. So James Bird is now he's on the ground now. And Bill King is stomping him. And we have Russell Brewer is kicking him like straight on. Right. And Sean Barry says the two men are laughing while they are doing this. James Bird was now trying to get, he's attempting to get up. So he's like on all fours, but he's still down. And Russell Brewer got a can of spray paint out of the back of the pickup truck. He then sprayed James Bird in the face with it. James Bird said nothing when this happened. He he almost didn't even react to it. Right. Russell Brewer then kicked him in the head very hard, and it was at this point that Sean Barry says that this was the last time that he saw James Bird move. Sean Barry says he was petrified to the point that he wet his pants. This next part is a bit unclear, but at this point, either one of two things happened, and and I'll explain this. Sean Barry is either inside the truck or Sean Barry had run off, but for whatever reason, he is not, he's not in a location where he can see what's going on at this point in his story. Right. Okay. Again, what he is claiming. Yes, this is what he's telling the investigators. So he says that he, at this point, this is when they must have chained James Bird up to the truck because he, for whatever reason, did not see this take place. So let's go through this statement a little bit here. Um, not not this direct one, but but all parts of it. Okay. So, so this statement is backed up with some of the evidence that we spoke about, with some of the evidence that was found. You know, we spoke about in the clearing, the investigators found several items that could have, um, let's say, fallen out of a truck, maybe while someone was trying to be pulled out of that vehicle. Right. Um, we also saw evidence of a struggle that took place. So Sean, per- Sean Barry does tell us these things in his story, and some of the evidence that was found backs portions of this story up. And we also have the witness statements saying that they saw James Bird in the truck as well. Okay, so at this point, the unfortunately, James Bird is has been he's been beat up and he's been chained to the back of this truck. Mm-hmm. They started dragging him down a dirt road. Now, Sean Barry says that the truck was so loud that he didn't hear anything. So so now he's back in the truck with the other two individuals. Correct. He says that at one point, Russell Brewer looked back behind the truck and he said, look, he's rolling. And he said, look, he's bouncing up and down, referring to James Bird behind the truck. Right. Sean Barry says that the other two men seem to be having fun at pointing out what was going on. He said the, the truck then careened around a bend and James bird's body swung off the road. This must be when it, when his body struck the, the ragged edge of this culvert. Mm -hmm. This is what severed his, his right arm, his shoulder, his neck and head from his body. Sean Barry says that King continued to drive for a little ways and then he stopped the truck. He got out of the vehicle and he untied Bird's lifeless body. He then threw the chain in the back of the truck. Mm -hmm. So James Bird Jr., he was dragged to um, Huff Creek Road, which would be roughly about three miles approximately from the location where police believe that this this fight had had ensued Mm -hmm. so we have king barry and brewer 
they they dumped James Bird's mutilated remains, and apparently they went to a barbecue of some sort. I don't know if this was at the the girlfriend of um, Bill King's, you know, at her house or what. But this would be pretty late. Yes. Well, or early, depending on how you look at it. But so they they go to a party afterwards. Yeah this this could be you know. You never know with with some of these stories. You may when when you have somebody say, "Yeah, they showed up here at four in the morning." Right. Well, what was it? Well, it was a barbecue at one point, or it right, was a right, party right. at one point, and now it's just four in the morning, leftover, you know, flops on the floor. Right. Well, okay. So it, it, there was a lot of questioning going on early in this investigation. At this point in the investigation, one, it was not known how long James Bird was alive during the dragging, but Brewer claimed that Bird's throat had been slashed before he was tied to the truck and then dragged. Later, we would learn that for forensic evidence suggests that bird had been attempting to keep his head up. Um, when he was being dragged, trying to keep his head up off of the road, uh, an autopsy suggested that James bird was alive for much of the dragging and died only after his head, shoulder and right arm were severed from his body from hitting the culvert. At this point, you know, the, the investigators are not only shocked at what they've heard, but it's also backing up kind of what their theory was from early in the investigation mm -hmm. as to how this went down. Not no, not necessarily that um, Sean Barry, you know, he didn't participate in this thing. He just happened to be there and pee his pants. Not that part of it. It's just backing up their thought that these three are the ones that are, in fact, responsible for this horrible crime. Yeah. And these three alone. Well, with that information, now they're going to have Sean Barry lead them to the chain. He will take them that day on that Monday to find the chain that was used to tie James Bird Jr. to the back of that truck. Right. The one that the Possum King put back into the truck. Yes, and I guess they find this chain in the in someone's backyard that they must have they must have drove around afterwards and dumped it somewhere. Right. Um, but he with his help they are able to locate this chain. So think about this for a second here, Captain. We have James Bird Jr., forty nine, full of life, out with friends and family on Saturday. A good a good guy. Just regular good dude. Mm -hmm. Walking home, gets offered a ride, and within hours, his body's found. You're talking about 7 a.m. on Sunday morning. People were getting up, and they're, they're starting their day. They're cooking breakfast. They're, mm -hmm. they're going, getting dressed and going off to church. You know, they're starting their day, and people, people found this body. Right. People right. found his body. These people that were getting up to start their day, the last day of their weekend. Well, right, and if if James doesn't get in that truck, maybe he's waking up and getting uh, going to church himself. And just and just within hours of the location of this of finding the body, mm -hmm. we have our first suspect rounded up. His two idiot friends are are gobbled up by police quickly after that. Right, they're interrogated for quite some time, which they well, we have be. a bunch of evidence at the scene. Yes. We've located a bunch of evidence. And then by Monday morning, we have a confession. And by, by, I believe it must have been around noon on Monday, one of the suspects took them to find the chain. So yeah, this is happening it, very quickly. Right. Which, but that's the murder weapon, basically. Yeah. And this is why, you know, I was, I, you know, in, in the last episode, I kept saying how much I like this sheriff roles. Um, and this is why. He is dealing with, think about this for a second, small town, right. small sheriff's department. According to his interview, this might have been only his second murder investigation in his tenure. Right. You know, these things, murders don't happen very often in this town. This type of crime doesn't happen that often in the entire nation. Yeah, in the world. Yeah. And so we're talking about a guy that really could have, you know, when you want to, when you want to talk about experience 
And sometimes we talk about in these cases where, well, they, they botched the investigation and they bungled the investigation because they're not experienced because they're just some small town keystone cops. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that's not the case here, and that's why I love this Sheriff Rolls. He's dealing with something that no town should ever have to experience, a crime that never should have happened. Right. And he's in, there's no textbook on this, and he's investigating this thing, and things are happening very quickly, and I think they're handling it. Yeah. I, I mean, this they, they could write a textbook on this. Yeah, and the, the problem here is... Uh, if you don't get this right, if you've messed this up, um, this is this is very bad. If you mess this up, you know it's one thing if you you know botch uh, something here and, or here or there, but this is a h- horrific crime. These are horrific individuals, and you need to make sure that you cross every T, dot every I, to make sure that these guys uh, never see the light of day ever again. And Sheriff Rolls, when asked, you know, why did you contact the FBI? He said very bluntly, you know, I, I didn't know the definition of a hate crime, right. but I knew this was one. Right. He didn't have to, to know that to, to get the FBI involved. Yeah. So after all this goes down, after the questioning and after locating the chain and the evidence that you spoke of, the sheriff's department, they do charge Sean Barry, uh, who is 23 years old, Bill King, who is 23 as well. And Lawrence Russell Brewer, 31 at the time, with murder. Now, the district attorney called for adding kidnapping charges to these charges. This would make it a capital crime. So once we have, we know the chain was involved. We know that they're chaining a man up and they're taking him Mm -hmm. away. That's kidnapping. And now we have it. We have the situation where we have kidnapping and murder charges facing these three guys all right we're back cheers mates cheers captain well holding three capital murder trials is a costly endeavor for any county but keep in mind, we're talking about a small county in this particular case. Yeah, This forced officials to raise local property taxes by 12%. That's a, that's a huge hike when you think about that. Well, this results in Mr. Bill King's lawyers asking that his trial be moved, arguing that the tax increase would make it impossible to draw an impartial jury. Bill King is going to be the first of these three guys that is brought to trial regarding the James Byrd Jr. murder. Possum King. And it was Judge Joe Bob Golden of state of the state district court that ordered that the trial go ahead, that, that we're not going to move it to another venue. There's not going to be a change of venue. We're going to continue with it here mm-hmm. in this county. And the prosecutors, they said publicly that they were confident that they would be able to get an impartial panel uh, of jurors that could be found for this trial. Mm -hmm. They were able to come up with a jury of 12. This ended up being seven men and five women. And it was 11 of these members were white. The sole black member of the jury was a corrections officer. And in fact, strange thing here is he would have been about the same age as Bill King. And I believe that they may have attended um, one of the same schools together at some point in their lives. Here's a weird thing here, Captain. And I don't know that it I don't know that it weird is the right term. It's more that just I think this is something that's lesser known mm-hmm. or maybe lesser accepted there's no way of me saying this without getting somebody sending me a rotten email, but, um, I'll send you one. Look, here's the thing. I'll send you a nice one. When, when we do these shows, when we sit here in the garage and we, and we retell these stories, when we, when we pull together all this information and we're telling you about these cases, about these real life events that happened, Uh we can't sit here worried about 
whether what's how it's going to be received what we say we can't sit here and worry about okay somebody's going to come down upon us for saying this or they're going to come down upon us if we say it this way so really what you just do is you just report the truth okay so when you send a rotten email keep in mind that we're reporting the truth to you first of all and second of all these are not the captain and i did not drive to jasper texas interview a bunch of people and put this story together to report it back to you. No, we are piecing well, this story did, together through. But you didn't want to go with me. So we're piecing this story together through court documents, as well as newspaper articles that were written by other people. And some of them being local reporters. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something that I have heard and read before in other cases, but it certainly translates to this one. You know, the, we said that they wanted to get impartial jurors, obviously, on this panel. Well, a problem that you have when you have a case of this magnitude, and it's this is a death penalty case. Okay, let's be very clear about that. Mm -hmm. What you tend to see happen is when you're trying somebody and the penalty, the possible penalty is death. Well, you have to interview these potential jurors and you have to decide if they fit on the panel. What tends to happen in a lot of these cases, you know, you ask, well, why is, is 11 members of the jury white and only one of them African American? Well, one, it just may so have happened to work out that way. You know, we don't, we don't know the details, but in a That's lot probably of probably what the prosecution wanted. Well, in a lot of these cases, what ends up happening is they dismiss a lot of African-American potential jurors because what tends to happen is they don't, they're not as, mm, let's say enthusiastic about the death penalty as, as, uh, white people may be. Okay. Um, and this could be, this is due to several factors. Um, one, one, it's the religious aspect. And two, um, unfortunately, in this country, pr predominantly when we see somebody that is has been charged and convicted wrongfully of a crime, it tends to be African-American people. So they, they have a better understanding that it's not a perfect system. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work 100%, 100% of the time. Therefore, unfortunately you know, we know this has happened and it, and it breaks your heart, but there has been at some point, some innocent person wrongly convicted and then sentenced to die. And they carried out that sentence. Right. And I think that that's something that, um, can get lost on some people. And that's why you see in these death penalty cases that it tends to be a little more white people on the group. Now the sole the sole African American member of the panel was actually elected as the foreman of the jury. Okay. Now some things that came out in trial here. Keep in mind this is Bill King that's being tried first. One thing that came out was the the forensic pathologist Tommy Brown. He he brought to court and testified as an expert witness stating that James Byrd was alive and writhing in pain until he was struck, until he struck that culvert that decapitated him. Yeah. Um, he stated that there was evidence that proved that James Byrd had fought to survive while he was chained by the ankles to the truck and being dragged. He said this would have taken place for about two miles along that paved country road. Stating he was attempting to keep his head off of the pavement and he was cautious. He was conscious during this time. Now Brown was the one that performed the official autopsy on bird. And he said that birds elbows and knees were ground to the bone as he tried to prop himself up off of the road. He stated that the victim would have been very tired, uh, very worn out, trying to do a lot of things, trying to keep the pain from being so severe. He probably would have been swapping one portion of his body for another, trying to get pressure off of other areas. Bird's head and right arm and shoulder were torn from his torso when he struck that concrete drainage culvert as the truck swerved from side to side, the path pathologist said 
it's his opinion that Bird was alive up until that point. So one thing I want to point out here that the pathologist said, they're dragging this guy and they're 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 weaving this truck as they're doing this, right. going down this street. They found remains of James Bird in 81 places along that stretch of road. Bill King's defense, well, it was a little different than the other two defendants that would later have their trial dates. His defense was basically that he wasn't there, that this crime went down and it was not committed by him because he was not there. His evidence to prove that is he states that there was a phone call. He was during this time that James Bird Jr. was killed, that he was on the phone with his girlfriend making arrangements so that he would end up there later. That, that you know, we keep saying later, but it's so early in the morning, it's confusing if, right. like, <laughs> if you're saying the right terms there. So that's his statement. Um, well, that does not go with the evidence they've, that they've found. They determined that he was on the phone closer to around like four in the morning. Right. And this would have been well after James Bird right Jr. Up. had been killed. So the timeline's not matching up to start with. Mm -hmm. Other evidence against Bill King is obviously we have Sean Barry's testimony. We also have, um, uh, a cigarette butt that was found at the location where the body was eventually located. Right. On that DNA DNA evidence, oh. this cigarette, butt um, uh, was, it was bill Kings and we have the lighter that was bill Kings. Yeah. The possum King lighter. So his defense regarding those two items was simply this one that the lighter had been stolen from him about a week before the murder had been committed. Yeah. Sure. And two, that the the truck, if if it was in fact Sean Barry's truck that was used and he was not present with Sean Barry, that it's likely that he had put out a cigarette at some point in Sean Barry's ashtray and that when these men were removing James Bird from the truck, when that struggle went down, that the ashtray would have been kicked and knocked to the ground, leaving cigarette butts and leaving this uh, evidence behind at the scene, right? What police and what the prosecutors were able to lay out to the jury is that there's some other problems with this story, because remember we said that they were at a party before they got angry about somebody being at the party and they left, right? Well, people at that party said, no, we saw bill King using that lighter that night. So he had it with him uh, during this party. So, so days after he says it was stolen from him. And then second of all, we have, um, Sean Barry's, he, we have his statement and we have this backed up by some other people that the truck had been recently cleaned. It had been recently cleaned out. And Sean Barry's statement was that the ashtray had been emptied and cleaned out prior to that day's events. Right. So, so it'd be a cigarette from at least that day. Yeah, and here's the other thing. Okay, let's say Barry, let's say Bill King, you were able to confuse us and and convince us that you weren't there using these uh, these other stories, which we know are not true. Right. Remember, we said that he had been kicking James Bird Jr. Right. And he had also walked and trampled all over the the crime scene. Yeah. They found DNA evidence. They found DNA evidence of James Bird Jr. on his footwear, on Bill King's footwear. Right. So let me just go over this real quick. So we have eyewitnesses putting them all three together that night, mm -hmm. uh, just a little bit before uh, James would have been picked up. We have DNA evidence of the cigarette butt. Yes. Uh, that was found there. We have the lighter that was found there. Um which probably has his DNA evidence on it too. And now we have James Bird's DNA evidence on um, Possum King's shoes. Correct. Or boots. So it only took the jury of 12. It only took them, it was like two and a half hours. Of mostly white people. Yeah. That decided that uh, Bill King, a white supremacist, should die by lethal injection for the murder of James Bird Jr. 
So found guilty and sentenced to die. And after the death sentence was announced, um, there was a priest that had read a statement from the, this is from Bill King's father. Okay. That said, please pray for the bird family who have endured an unimaginable pain and loss. Please pray for these jurors who have shouldered a terrible burden. Please pray for our town of Jasper, a community that remains strong, though scarred by this unspeakable act. Mm. Now, the younger Mr. King, uh, Bill King, who was on trial, also left a written statement behind. And as he was taken away to prison, he left this statement that said, though I remain adamant about my innocence, it's been obvious from the beginning that this community would get what they desire. So I close with the words of Francis Yaki. The promise of success is with the man who is determined to die proudly when it's no longer possible to live proudly. And it was signed sincerely John W. King. And that was from Francis Bukaki. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on his way out of the courthouse, when they were taking Bill King out of the courthouse and onto prison, um, well, yeah. he, okay. So he's asked by reporters if he has anything to say to the bird family at this point, Bill King smirked and he responded with an obscenity. Um, what do you say? Um, I, I would prefer not to say it myself. If you want to, you can go ahead. The thing is, I don't know what he said. Well, then <laughs> you'll have to locate that. He said something extremely rude to the family of, of a murder victim, whether he's guilty or not. Okay. Um, well, st- let me stop that. And you tell me, all right, we're back. Magic of podcast. <laughs> uh, so what he said when asked if he had anything to say to the bird family, he said, um, you can suck my dick is what he said. Yeah. And uh, you know, I hesitated to tell that story in its entirety because, because of this, um, look, cause you're a good boy. Well, Bill King is, is a horrible man. And if there, if there is a hell, I hope he gets there. Okay. But the thing is, captain, I, you know, we got to tell the whole story. Like we just said, we got to tell the truth and to be perfectly clear, he was in an interview and I think this would have been two or three years after the crime or two or three years after he was sentenced. Anyway, during this interview, he, he was asked why he would say that to his victim's family. Right. And he stated that he had, while he had nothing nice to say to the bird family in this interview, he was clearing up that that was not, he was not directing that comment to the bird family. Right. They were escorting him. And as they escort such a pile of dog shit that people in the crowd are going to yell stuff at him. Yeah. They're the, the crowd is taunting him. He's just been sentenced to death. He's being walked off to prison and they're taunting him. They're saying horrible things to him. He was responding with something horrible back at one of those persons to which then a reporter jumps in front and right, right. has a microphone and says, you got anything to say to the bird family in it? That's how, according to Bill King, that's how yeah, that but, went down. Who knows? Again, but this this is very similar to him explaining away like pieces of evidence. Oh, just a happenstance, you know? Yeah. Like, no, th- you're a, you're a giant pile of shit. Well, the and, thing is, if you if you want to look at it from the opposite direction and say that that's what his intentions were, that he did intend to say that, um. You, you obviously have plenty of evidence to believe that he would have said that right. because of we've, we've seen, look, and when we say there's some people that are hearing about this case for the first time today and they're going, well, uh, white supremacist, how do you, how do you know? He just said some things. How do we know what really happened? No, they found plenty of evidence in his dwelling that he was not only a white supremacist, but he was wanting to start an, an organization right. that was going to do horrible things to African-Americans Um, you have tattoos all over your body about it. Yeah. There's no question of who this guy was. And so when you see how dumb and ignorant he must be to have those beliefs and to want to organize such a group, then it's very quick and very easy to believe that he would have been dumb enough as he's being carted out of court 
to say something that stupid to the public regarding his victim's family, knowing that he would have appeals to face, knowing that, you know what, in the, in the, in the end, the people that, that sentence you to death is the community. Yeah. In the end, and if, if you upset them and if you piss them off and if you do a crime this bad and you show no remorse, absolute, absolutely no remorse for what you've done, this community is going to make sure that death sentence gets carried out. Well, and this is not the sentence he should have got anyways. I mean, if you're going to have the death penalty, right, mm -hmm. then I say go full out. Now, I don't believe in the death penalty because of the idea that there could be an innocent person that is uh, tried and sentenced to death and then that's carried out. And just one innocent person dying from something is too much in my mind. But if you're going to have it, it's the idea of eye for an eye. And so if you're going to do that, then the Possum King, you know, uh, let me get some guys from Jasper or let's round up some of my buddies and let me stomp and kick the shit out of this guy and chain him to a, the back of a truck. That's what should happen to this individual. We still have two trials to get through. And as I said, Bill King's defense was a little bit different than what Sean Barry's would be and Russell Brewer's would be. Let's go over Brewer's first. Yeah, because he was actually tried second. So Bill King's defense was he was innocent. He was not there. He didn't he didn't, you know, right. liar. He didn't have anything to do with this murder. Well, Russell Brewer, his statement is going to be that, well, yeah, he was there, but he didn't take he didn't participate in any of the actions that led to James Bird's death. So he, that, he's that, going to be similar. That he was just yeah, that he was just there, he was he was in a situation that he couldn't control and things got out of hand and he was a witness to this, not a participant. Right, but we've heard this story before, haven't we? Yeah, and so let's go let's go into that. Now, we're going to kind of mesh these other two trials together because they're very similar in this sense. Okay. Sean Barry, his defense was pretty much the same thing. Yes, he was there. He was a witness to this situation. He was not a participant in this situation. So in both trials, what you end up having captain is you have Sean Barry repeating the story that I told you earlier that he told to investigators, right? Uh, he's going to put the blame on Russell Brewer and Bill King. And then you want to flip that over in the other trial. You're going to have Russell Brewer. Who's going to put all the blame on Sean Barry and Bill King. Right, right, right. So the only difference between the two that I noticed right away, uh, would be that, that Russell Brewer did get a change of venue for some reason. Um, and then Sean Barry did not. So two of the trials were held in Jasper wonder, and, and the other one was not. Well, it could have had something to do with those two guys were Jasper resi residents for a while. So maybe that's what it was. And maybe because Brewer was from a different county, he could have had a different um, address or something. And maybe the lawyers could do some wiggling or finagling so they could get to a different venue. I think that... In Brewer's case, and I'm, I'm going off of memory, this didn't make it to my notes here, but I think in Brewer's case, the reason why they were able to get the change of venue was because it was the trial that immediately followed Bill King's. Right, right. Where, okay. And because Bill King was guilty and very obviously guilty, um, I think Brewer's attorneys were able to present that it was going to be very tough for him to get a fair trial there. Now, with Barry's case, with Sean Barry's case, I think because he was, whether he's telling the 100% truth or not, we will probably never know. However, he was the one that showed some ability of helping out and assisting the police in their investigation by telling them some kind of story, by leading them to the chain where... Uh, I think because of those actions, the judge was pretty certain he was going to get a fair trial. Well, the conclusion to these trials, Russell Brewer, he was found guilty of murder and mm -hmm. kidnapping, and he too would be sentenced to death. Now, Sean Barry, the jury decided that they were not going to, uh, they were going to spare him the death penalty. In his trial, we had the situation where we have Russell Brewer who testified that Sean Barry had cut 
James Bird's throat before Bird was tied to the truck. Right. The jury decided that there was not a lot of evidence to support this claim. So therefore, you know, like we said, we have each guy basically painting the same picture. They're just taking themselves out of the picture. Yeah. I don't know. The one thing I could not get to the bottom of in this case, Captain, was was his throat actually cut? Because this was this was kind of a big deal in the trial, whether that it pointed towards more guilt by Sean Barry than than what he came forward with. I couldn't find anything that definitively said that that had happened. Now, unfortunately, um, well, as, we, as we know, given the, the, the factors of the crime, they may not have been able to determine that. Right. And I think a couple things here. I think, one, it's possible that uh, Brewer's defense basically just mimicked what they could get from Barry's defense. Mm-hmm. Um, and if that's the case, then they're just going to, you know, um, Barry saying that the throat was cut. So therefore we're going to say that it was Barry. Yeah. Um, who knows? I, I would, and this is going to sound awful, but uh, there's a part of me that doesn't want to believe. Um, and I, I don't want to believe that he was alive when he was right. being dragged. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. it sounds awful, but when you put thought into it, it's it's, uh, it's a thought of mercy in a way. Um, it, the thing here is they found, you know, whether you want to believe Barry's story or Brewer's story or whatever, I do believe without Sean Barry caving like he did in telling them what happened or at least his version of what happened, I think it would have been a little tough it would have been harder, yes. It would have been harder to get Bill King convicted. It would have certainly been harder to get Russell Brewer convicted. Now, however, I say that, but they did find DNA evidence of all three of these guys at the crime scene. And this would have been on cigarette butts and, and beer bottles. Yeah, but 98, right? right. I mean, our, our understanding of DNA technology was, wasn't that great then. Mm-hmm. So as far as the jury was concerned, maybe they wouldn't and indict these guys. They were also able to prove that tire marks found in the area did in fact come from the tires on Barry's pickup truck. So there's a lot of evidence that, that points to the guilt of these guys. Yeah. Unfortunately, we only get Barry's version and Brewer's version of what actually happened in all likelihood. You know, I, I, they did present people at Barry's trial that said he wasn't a racist. I don't believe that. Uh, maybe he wasn't at one point in his life. I, I don't know how that works to be honest with you. Um, but I think that I think all three of these guys were absolutely involved in this horrible crime. I think we're not getting the full story from either Barry or Brewer. Right. And I, King's not talking. I mean, it's, it's a mixture you know, in every one of these cases that we cover, Captain, they they break your heart, okay? They break yeah. your heart first, and then after that, they break your brain. They break your brain because you're trying to figure out how are people even capable of doing such horrible things to one another. Yeah. And in each one of these cases, because of, of the heartbreak and because of, of the pain that, that, that I have to take in from from looking at these cases, I'm looking for... I'm looking for a little tidbit, a little morsel of something that can make me smile at some point during this case. I was able to find a big one of those later, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But while we're on our way to that, the fr- the the first tidbit that I found that made me smile was that when Bill King was transported, I don't know how many facilities actually handle the execution of these inmates in Texas. Right. It may be more than one, but... The facility that he was transferred to, there is an intake facility for all of the death penalty uh, death row inmates. And the name of that intact, um, the name of that facility is James Bird Jr. Um, it would have a different middle name, but there's a little bit of a. That's odd. It's odd. And it has the, the, the name has no relation to our victim. Right. Um, but it, it kind of, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's almost a wink. It's, it's a little a, wink, a wink almo- and a nod. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost, a, but it's almost a little wink from, uh, James, you know, in heaven. 
looking down and and going, "Hey, I got gotcha. you." Mm-hmm. You know. So um, so two of these guys were sentenced to death. Uh, one of them has actually been executed. His appeals ran out. Right. Um, and this was Lawrence Russell Brewer. He was killed in September 21st of 2011. Um, he he is known for something else as well as committing this horrible crime. He, listen, well, listen to this. This is, you know, where we had that wink and nod to feel good about for a second there. Right. He, he gave an interview shortly before he was sentenced before he was put to death. And in this interview, Brewer expressed no remorse for his crimes. Piece and in fact, shit. he told a Houston newspaper or a Houston news channel, I'm sorry, that as far as any regrets, I have no regrets. No, I'd do it all over again to tell you the truth. Yeah, piece of shit. So he just took away our wink and our nod. But, but know that his sentence was carried out. Mm-hmm. Before his execution, though, Brewer ordered a large meal. You know, we've talked about this before. You get your last meal yeah. when you're on death row. And he ordered a large meal that included, get ready for this. I'm ready. Um, it included two chicken fried steaks, a triple meat bacon cheeseburger, mm-hmm. a large bowl of fried okra, a pound of barbecue, three fajitas, a meat lover's pizza, a pint of ice cream and a slab of peanut butter fudge with lots of crushed peanuts in it. Mm. However, he did not eat any of this. He ordered all of this food and ate (sighs) none of it. Just when you think you couldn't dislike a guy anymore. Well, what this prompted was the Texas prison prison officials. They ended the 87 year old tradition of giving special last meals to condemned inmates. So, um, look, I'm not going to lie. As a true crime fan, uh, I enjoy talking about the last meal. Yeah, it's weird. It's one of those guilty pleasures where you're like, uh, I shouldn't enjoy this. I shouldn't this, enjoy but, it, but I do. But, but I find it fascinating what people would come up with their last meal. But, the, but, but there's a part of me that just goes, hey, you know, these animals don't deserve to pick their last meal. You know, their last meal, they should go hungry. Let them feel well, hunger for a while. And nothing against the Texas prison officials, but with an order like this, come on, we know something's up here. You know, like, shouldn't it be like, okay, you get this, you get this plate and it's 15 by 12 and whatever you can fit on it, that's it, you know, yeah, or, or, or you have a dollar amount. Right. So now, nowadays, the, um, before an inmate is executed in the state of Texas, now they just eat whatever the other inmates eat. Right, that whatever day. the meal is. Yeah. Right. Why why should they treat you any different? You know. So the other two guys are still in prison. We have uh Bill King who at some point will be executed for this uh murder. He still has some pending appeals. Um he's running out of them. We have Sean Barry who is in prison, life in prison. Um, but he is, he's actually eligible for parole and this won't be until June of 2038. You're not getting out. No, no, no. He's not getting out. And if you get out, somebody's going to kill you. I I wouldn't, I wouldn't. And and, well, you, you talk about somebody killing him. He's actually in protective custody in prison. I don't know if it's still to this day, but for a lot of the early portion of his sentence, uh, he was spending, 23 hours per day in an eight by six foot cell with only one hour a day for exercise. Uh, and this is obviously to protect him against, like you said, somebody's somebody, he's got a target on him for the rest of his days. Well, as well as he should, there was a moment of reconciliation for the town of Jasper. And this came when they, they knocked down a rickety old fence that for more than 100 years had separated the black graves from the white graves in the Jasper City Cemetery. Yeah. Uh, So this was a segregated cemetery, and they finally removed that. They they did have a little ceremony, and they had a prayer vigil that went along with this ceremony to, you know, to to mark this occasion. I do want to point out, however, that James Bird Jr.'s grave site, it does have a fence around it, and that's not to keep him segregated from anybody else in the cemetery it's because of this disturbing fact that at some point 
some teenagers, they desecrated the grave. You know, they, I believe they kicked over the headstone and there was yeah. some kind of damage done to the grave. I think they even spray painted some things on the stone itself. So that, that fence was simply put up to protect that memorial for that man for James and to stop people from doing that type of behavior. Well, because you know, this is a, this is a hate crime and this was done by three racist individuals and, uh, ignorance will breed ignorance and there'll be Mm -hmm. some moron out there that will go to James Berg's grave and desecrate it in the, in the name of white supremacy, you know? Mm. So captain, you've been, you've been calm. You've been pretty good. Uh, I'm trying to be in the garage. I know you, you might be holding back a little bit. Is there anything you want to add? Uh, well, I think it's sad that if that this case isn't as known as, you know, maybe it should be. Mm-hmm. I think to shed a light on something, this is, these kind of murders took place very often for a long period of time. And I think this is a reminder of that. Mm -hmm. And it's a horrific crime, Um, especially to somebody that seemed to be a good guy that lived by the golden rule. He treated others like he wanted to be treated. Mm -hmm. And then you get these weak minded and weak individuals that come along with these weak and um, ignorant ideas on how the world should be. And they carry out this horrible crime and then they go on and they lie about it or some of them lie about it. And the fact of the matter is that whether it's Brewer or Barry when somebody is trying to pull out James from the truck, if one person jumps in, now it's two against two. At least it's a fair fight. But you didn't want it to be a fair fight because you're weak. Mm-hmm. And, and then if both of them are claiming, well, it's the other guy or this, well, but if you both jump in to help James out, now it's three against one. And this murder never takes place but you're weak and you're, you're a giant pile of shit. And like I said, if if you're going to have the death penalty, then these guys should have been tied up to a truck and drug down the street for miles. And, and that's if, what should have happened. And if you're in that situation, you know, I look, the captain's absolutely right. Each one of these people are weak. They're, they're weak t- together in a, as a group. They're weak as individuals. But... Even in this situation, if you're in this situation and you're afraid or you're scared, at least go and get help. At least go and get somebody. At least go and tell somebody what is happening or what may be about to happen. Yeah. So that you can put an end to this somehow in some way and save a good guy's life. This was a guy that was about the community. This was, he was somebody that was known. He was a fixture in the community. Well, he's human and and it doesn't matter if you're black, white, yellow, or red. He's a human, right? And, and the, and the fact of the matter is you either stand for something, but, or you fall for anything. Is that what it's called? Right. Something like that. But it's like, you got to stand up. And, and I think this should be a lesson to all of us. I mean, it's not just, when a crime is going down or some uh, brutal beating is happening. That's not when you need to stand up. You need to stand up every time there is ignorance and any time that you see ignorance, because if you don't, if you don't say anything, if you just turn the other cheek, that is, that is one of the lessons here. The here's these two guys that put the blame on other people. I I think they put the blame on other people because they wanted to save themselves. I wanted, I think they wanted to think, you know, maybe more so, uh, Barry than Brewer because Brewer had no remorse and, you know, didn't want, you know, you're not even going to apologize. Yeah. You, you want to change anything, you know, uh, I think the, what I'm trying to get at is it doesn't matter if it, if it's a violent attack or just a violent attack with words, it is your duty, or at least I think it's our duty as uh, humans to speak up and protect others and 
and it's just um it's just a horribly sad case and it's just not one that has been talked about enough uh, in the true crime community i do want to talk about what i thought was that tidbit of of joy and peacefulness that i needed when looking at this case and that was the bird family i mean i cannot say enough good things about these people regarding their 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 class their um their integrity just who they are as people as individuals and as a group and i'm talking about james bird's parents i'm talking about his ex-wife i'm talking about his children renee ross and jamie i see i see a group of people that are they don't they're not looking for revenge for their loved one's death right they they are looking to be strong and to try to heal from this and try to this this is what makes them such great people even during their grieving process they were trying to help their town and their community heal from this as well and i think we could all learn a lot from the bird family from from his parents from his children and how we should carry ourselves in our everyday lives because i tell you what you know a, a person's character is best judged in the time of tragedy and i can think of no bigger tragedy than what we talked about today well, and, and then be, how this family conducted themselves afterwards yeah cuz it'd be easy to take um you know the hatred and the ignorance of these three individuals and then take that and internalize it and then release that back onto the world mm-hmm. and and you know the bird family decided not to do that and to be ab- above that and i don't i don't know that i could and that's why i look at i look at the bird family and i remind myself these are people that are they're smarter than me they're better than me they're they're good people and there's things that i can learn from them ah uh, you don't give don't don't beat yourself up so no but so you know much. you're but, not you're not that bad i mean you're pretty bad I mean, but here's where i will pat myself smell funny here's where i will pat myself on the back and this is what i hope everybody else does mm. just accept that there's things that you can learn from good individuals like this accept that and try to learn from these people that's what you do that's what a good person does we all have flaws we we can all work on them yeah one of the things for me is um and and i think we both heard about this case back in 1998 uh but i was listening to i want to say like this american life and um this case was just briefly mentioned uh in a rap lyric which reminded me of the case and then i dove a little bit back into it and and just felt that it was important like i said to cover but one of the things that you know talk about a uh, positive moment was for whatever reason, like it's like I didn't know James Bird, but I but I know James Bird. If that makes any sense, I worked at a recording studio for many of years, and there was multiple artists that would say, "I'm going to put you on the map." You know, not not that they're going to put Columbus on the map or anything, but they're going to put me as a producer on the map. And uh, so when you hear over and over uh, these stories of James Bird telling everybody, I am going to put Jasper on the map. And I just wonder if there was just some intuition that he had. And his death doesn't have to be in vain. And it's up to us to carry on not the legacy of his murder, but what he was in his life. And that would be treating people the way you would want to be treated. All right, Captain, I want to thank you for everything this week. Thank you, Colonel. All right, everybody, thank you for joining us in the garage. Until next time, be good, be kind, and don't litter.